Good morning, everybody. <laughs> we awake? We awake this morning, ready to go? Oh, boy. Well, on behalf of the Pinellas County Commission, let me welcome you to the fourth meeting of the Wastewater Stormwater Task Force Steering Committee here at St. Petersburg College, the Seminole Campus Digitorium. St. Pete College has been an excellent partner, allowing us to hold our meetings and providing staff and technology support at this great venue. And I want to thank SBC President Dr. Tanya Williams and Seminole Campus Provost Mark Strickland for their partnership. And speaking of partnership, that is what this task force represents and the work that we're putting into it. In fact, as you can see on today's agenda and the screens above me, we now have a logo to reinforce that aim. As you know, we formed this group in October of 2016 to bring together representatives of Pinellas County, our communities, and agency partners to collaborate in addressing our critical wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs. The partnership is made up of the steering committee of elected officials and policymakers, the technical working group whose members include county and municipal experts in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. And first, I'd like to take a moment to have our steering committee members stand to be recognized. If you're on the steering committee, our policymakers, would you stand to be recognized? Mayors, elected officials. <laughs> See the mayor of St. Pete Beach, Mayor Christman from St. Petersburg, and Jim Quinn from the City of Seminole. We appreciate uh, you being here as well. Now, if you're on the technical working group, the, the brains of the operation, would you please rise and be recognized? We thank you for being here and thank you for your time and efforts on this issue. As a reminder, last year the partnership identified three primary goals as we prioritized our wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Avoiding and mitigating spills, increasing treatment capacity and system resiliency, and seeking the opportunities to address drainage issues that affect the sanitary sewer system. At the last meeting of the steering committee in June, we reviewed progress updates on the technical work groups initial action plan based upon these goals, which includes seven main categories. Inflow and infiltration studies. And I would take note that uh, the county, as part of our BP settlement funds, we invested uh, $1 million from the BP funds for our I, &I studies. Uh, second on that is addressing insufficient pipe capacities. Rehab and replacement programs for aging infrastructure. Stormwater drainage improvements. Resource sharing and maximization developing a public dialogue program, and developing legislation, regulations, and local ordinances. I mentioned our action plan because today is all about action. Each member of this partnership has taken action and made significant progress on some or all of these items. Members of our technical working group are here to provide updates on the things they have done as in local projects throughout our county, whether they're completed or they're underway, as well as address future plans to further address these areas. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. We have Megan Ross, Interim Utilities Director from Pinellas County. Ray Bowler, Public Works Director for Safety Harbor. Dave Porter, Public Utilities Director for Clearwater. Paul Smith, Public Services Director for Tarpon Springs. Tom Nichols, Public Works Director for the City of Gulfport. And Claude Tankersley, Public Works Administrator for St. Petersburg. This, the empty chair down there, hopefully Claude is on his way. So I want to thank you again for being here, for being part of this discussion, part of this community collaboration. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters, and uh, I'll be back to moderate the program after their presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Justice. Good morning. My name is Megan Ross. I'm the Interim Utilities Director for Pinellas County. It is my pleasure to be here today to share with many of our local community leaders and partners our progress not only to maintain infrastructure resiliency, but also to ensure a bright and stable future for our community and environment. To summarize in one word what today's presentation represents, as Commissioner Justice just stated, it is action. We have taken action, as you will see today, to invest, improve, and maintain our stormwater and wastewater infrastructure, and thereby protect public health, safeguard the environment, and provide stability to the very foundation of our community. Our presentation today will provide a progress report on our collaborative accomplishments. We will also provide a brief overview of our goals and action plan, we'll present some examples of our progress, and conclude with an opportunity to answer questions. Before I continue, I'd like to point out that there is a website that you can visit to learn more about our program, our task force, and some of the accomplishments that we've made. It's www 
pinellascounty.org forward slash task force. And it'll be up here throughout the remainder of the presentation. The core principles of the Partnerships Technical Working Group, or task force, include seven areas that directly relate to the importance of wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. These principles include maintaining public health and preserving the environment, particularly our water quality, which affects our entire community. To review, Pinellas County is made up of 24 different municipalities. And in 2016, Pinellas County partnered with 17 municipalities of the 24 who maintain wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. This partnership or technical group is known as the task force. Pinellas County in total has 12 wastewater treatment plants serving 306,495 customers, which yields a total permitted capacity of 155 million gallons per day. The task force goals that were agreed upon were simple, to avoid and mitigate spills, overflows, and releases of sewage into the environment, particularly water bodies to seek opportunities to address drainage and stormwater issues that impact the sewer system, and to increase capacity and resiliency of collective sewer system and wastewater treatment infrastructure. In order to meet these three goals effectively, the Pinellas County Task Force developed an action plan comprised of seven components to improve countywide management of stormwater and wastewater in the sanitary sewer system, especially during heavy rain events. The umbrella you see here represents the unified strategic approach that the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership has taken, while the hand holding the umbrella represents the resource sharing and maximization that has made this partnership successful. The action plan includes the following components. The first one is inflow and infiltration studies. This includes the assessment of our sewer collection system to identify areas of groundwater or surface water intrusion. The second component is system hydraulic bottlenecks. A hydraulic bottleneck is a pipe in the sewer system that fills up with water when it rains, and it is too small to allow all of the water through. Similar to a traffic jam bottleneck, this bottleneck causes wastewater to back up into the system and can cause sewer overflows upstream. In this component, we are working towards identifying those particular pipes and planning projects that will replace them with larger ones so that it can convey all of the wastewater. Our third component is rehabilitation and replacement. This action includes improving or replacing our aging infrastructure. These are pipes that are cracked due to age. Stormwater and groundwater can seep in through these cracks, similar to how an old roof may leak when it is raining. The fourth component is stormwater drainage improvements. This action involves identifying areas where water is collecting or flooding during a rainstorm. When that flooding occurs, that water can enter the sewer system through manholes and cracked pipes. Eliminating this stormwater flooding through proper drainage will remove the strain on the sewer system. The fifth component is resource sharing and maximization. This is the component that holds the partnership together. This action involves being a good neighbor, sharing our resources, working together collaboratively for the good of our community and customers. The sixth component is public dialogue. This action involves recognizing that we as a community have input and involvement with our environment. It starts with proper education of how to inspect your private home sewer line so that it does not negatively impact the sewer system and the environment. The seventh component and final component is legislation. And what this is, is providing a framework by which we can educate, assist, and enforce proper maintenance of sewer lines for our customers, as well as private sewer systems. The graphic that you see here, and that is displayed on posters throughout the auditorium, depicts all of the different infrastructure components that need to be addressed to provide a holistic solution to the storm and groundwater intrusion into the system while we, the public utilities, can do our part to maintain the infrastructure, a key component of the solution will be our customers in maintaining and repairing their individual residential sewer pipes, as well as private sewer collection systems throughout the county. Many homeowners do not know that this part of the infrastructure on their property is their responsibility to maintain, and for the most part may not even realize that their line could be damaged 
even without experiencing drainage problems within their home. A leaky roof, for example, is very noticeable when it rains and will typically cause concern. A leaky sewer pipe is not noticeable due to it being underground and out of sight. Working together to propose repair and inspection programs to protect the integrity of these lines has immense benefits to the county to control or eliminate a large stormwater and groundwater infiltration and inflow source. Now let's talk action. We have all been making significant progress by initiating 183 projects within the four infrastructure components of the action plan. First, I would like to impress upon you the magnitude of our industry. Altogether, the wastewater and stormwater industry is, is a well over half a billion dollar industry per year. And with that investment, we've initiated 51 inflow and infiltration studies this fiscal year. We have 18 projects where hydraulic bottlenecks have been identified. We have 31 rehabilitation and replacement projects that replace or upgrade aging infrastructure. And we have 83 stormwater drainage projects to eliminate flooding and maintain stormwater infrastructure. As you can see from this map, which depicts all of the project locations and areas to be studied, there is work going on throughout the entire county to make progress towards the task force goals. And at this point in time, I'd like to welcome Ray Bowler from the City of Safety Harbor to discuss the action we're taking towards the first component, which is the inflow and infiltration studies. Good morning, Ray Bowler, City of Safety Harbor Public Works Director. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the I&I. &I. Uh, again, like Megan said, there's 51 projects throughout the whole county not just the county, but all the cities as well. We have been doing this throughout our careers, but with this task force, collectively, we're all working together and coming up with ideas. I and I, which is inflow and infiltration. Inflow is really water that we're not intending to get into our wastewater system. Generally, it's stormwater, and where does that come from? Well, as the map indicates, we're th going throughout the whole city, where those systems are coming from. What we end up doing first is cleaning and doing inspections. To clean it, we have, um, we have to, the lines are cleared and cleaned that come from blocks such as grease, wipeable flushes, or wipes, and other buildups. The inspection of the lines find impaired sewers, which then can be marked for replacement or for lining. The bottom photo shows a camera. We send that camera up into our lines to look for where we have leakages or cracks or failed pipes. Then we can go ahead and line which ones we need to or set programs in place where we're able to do those studies. One of the easy studies is a smoke test, and you'll see a video here in a little bit. But the smoke test is where we put smoke into those lines, we pump them, and you'll see them coming out of the ground and out of the roof fence. If it's coming out of the roof vent, that's a good thing. If it's coming out of a storm drain on the roof, or if it's coming out of your clean out in front of your home or behind your home where your sanitary lateral leaves, that is not a good sign. And those are really easy fixes and relatively cheap. What we'd like to see is if uh, you have a low area in your home and your clean out is there and the cap is missing, just put the cap on because that storm water will enter, that's inflow. Uh, once we find where we have some areas with that smoke testing, we can go ahead and set up flow monitoring. Flow monitoring will isolate these areas of concern and then we're able to, again, come up with a project that would be able to address where that comes from. The hydraulic modeling helps us quantify a specific sewer line that's supposed to compare how much water is actually coming in and what it's supposed to carry. So that will differentiate between um, the water, the groundwater, and the wastewater. The top photo is, shows where we've actually put a liner into, or a sock, into an existing wastewater line, and it's being cured. We put heat onto that system, and it's a, an epoxy, so it seals the pipe, and it becomes rigid, and it will then stop any of the infiltration coming into that system. The county is actually doing an in-depth study in the south area of the county. 
There are 16 areas. This is a three-year study program, so they could try to locate much whether it is actually the smoke testing or even the flow monitoring and the hydraulic analysis, so they can pinpoint an area to help possibly eliminate any of the SSOs, the sanitary sewer overflows. We certainly are looking at a way to develop, mitigate any of these strategies to improve that collection system. And this last slide is the smoke testing. The city of Largo is going through this smoke testing area. And again, I mentioned how this can help determine where we have areas, roof vents or drain vents or the slide. Can you run the video, please? It's hard not to be a little worried when you see smoke pouring out of homes and from the sewer. But City of Largo officials are getting the word out this is all normal. We're looking for leaks. To do that, crews are doing what's called a smoke test. They send non-toxic mineral water into sewer lines trying to pinpoint broken pipes. If that smoke comes out of those rooftop vents, that's usually a good sign the lines are clear. But in some cases, they find trouble spots. Sewer overflows have been a problem in certain areas of Largo during recent storms with sewage ending up in waterways. The hope is this testing will keep rain and groundwater out of pipes. It's one of the As you can see from there, coming out of the roof again is a good thing, but that storm water that was running over the ground, if we have uh, manholes that have missing or broken caps, that water can then infiltrate our wastewater system. If you have that storm water coming off of your roof, and it's draining into your sewer lateral, into the caps, that again is extra water that we have to take in account and work in capacity at the wastewater treatment plants, which is what we're trying to eliminate. Um, now I'll go ahead and bring Dave Porter, City of Clearwater, to talk about the bottlenecks. Thank you, Ray. Uh, good morning, all. My name is Dave Porter. I'm with the City of Clearwater. I'm the Public Utilities Director. I'd like to talk to you somewhat this morning about bottlenecks. So, as Megan described earlier, what is a bottleneck? A bottleneck occurs in our collection system when pipes are sized such that the pipe cannot pass all of the flow that is routed to it during the normal times or during a storm, most often during a storm. Um, when that happens, we have what's called a sanitary sewer overflow that occurs in the system. The, the sewage will actually back up into the pipeline, into a manhole, and then it can overflow, and that's when you see uh, the sewer uh, overflows that you've seen in the last storms. Normally, most of the ones you see today occur from two reasons. They either occur because of a storm event and too much water getting into the sewer, or because of some kind of a backup due to some kind of a plugging event that occurs in the sewer. Today, I want to talk about the first ones. What happens when we get a lot of flow in the, the lines, but the pipes, for some reason, just cannot pass it? Well, when that occurs, we must then determine where those problems are. So where is that issue, where is that pipeline or series of pipelines that are creating the problem with the sanitary sewer overflow? That sounds easy, but it may not be because the pipes are a network of pipes and any one or more could actually be causing the bottleneck. So part of what we do is we use the infiltration and inflow studies and some of the mapping and modeling that we'll be talking about today to look for those lines and also physically going out during storms and other events and trying to determine where those lines are backed up by looking in the manholes themselves. So there's 18 projects underway right now as we sit here today um, from members of our task force or communities in, in Pinellas County. Um, all of those projects have taken quite some time, uh, as you might, might um, guess. I mean, we just talked about doing an infiltration inflow study, doing nighttime flow monitoring. Those types of things take time. And then when we find the problem, then we have to engineer a solution, obtain the funds to fix it, and get a contractor out there to actually tear it up and fix the problem. So let's look at a couple of projects. Uh, that are underway, and these are examples of some of the 18. Um, in the city of Largo, they've just finished uh, construction and are now placed into operation a five million gallon a day flow equalization facility. This, this allows um, wastewater to enter the wastewater treatment plant itself 
at a much higher rate than the plant could probably handle during normal events. So that's the bottleneck there. Too much flow, the plant can't handle it. So what do you do? You capture that flow in a tank and then you release it slowly over time so that that bottleneck is uh, alleviated. So the city's worked on that. It's taken quite some time and it's a pretty large facility. As you can see, that tank right there is the five million gallon tank that holds the flow when, it's, uh, when it rains. So that's an example of one of the projects. The county and all of us as well, most of the municipalities, are working through a modeling program right now that we are modeling using mathematical methods our sewer systems. That mathematical modeling is very important because those models allow us then to determine when we should see overflows based on certain flow rates. We can induce in the model a higher flow rate and predict where those problems may come. It helps us find these issues and correct them much quicker. Fairly new technologies, but it's been around for quite, you know, well, it's been around for quite a while, but with the invention uh, invent of new computer systems that are much faster, we can actually do this modeling much more effectively than we did in the past and do what's called real-time modeling as well, measure it against flows in the system. And as you might see in this, um, in this model for the county, if you look at the red square right there, they're predicting that that particular manhole at a certain flow rate will have a problem. So now they can send their crews out, verify that that's where the location of the problem is, design a fix, and fix it much quicker than we could have in the past. And this is an example of using current technology to, stop, to help uh, alleviate these problems. Once, it's, once the problem is found, then the next issue is, what do we do to fix it? This is an example of a project that, here, that we in Clearwater are undertaking right now. Um, we've identified a problem in uh, our Long Gulf to Bay on Corona Interceptor, where under the right set of circumstances and the right flow rates, we had an SSO or sanitary sewer overflow during the last hurricane, or I'm sorry, not the last two ago, Hermine. Um, when we identified that, we immediately went out, had our engineers take a look at what was going on, model the system, physically go out and do what's called nighttime flow isolation, look at, the, look at the system and see how it runs during the evening hours to see where flow might be or backing up where it shouldn't be. Um, that led us to determine where the problem was. It was a series of interconnected pipes that were incorrectly sized. So for the last year, we've been uh, designing and now constructing modifications to that piping system there so that at the next storm, we shouldn't have this problem. And this project's just about complete. So it'll be finished before this next uh, hurricane season. So these are just some examples of the 18 projects that we're working on. And we're working very hard to get them all done and find some more so that we can continuously upgrade our systems. So with that, I would like to pass the, uh, the Switcher here on to uh, Paul Smith with uh, City of Tarpon Springs. Good morning, Paul Smith, Public Services Director, and I look out and I see a lot of our teammates from our countywide working group. I really appreciate you all coming today and I appreciate the opportunity to work with you on solutions here. I'm talking about rehabilitation and replacement or R&R on these slides and uh, this is a continued investment in our infrastructure. Once the cleaning and inspections are complete, we can take a look at our deficiencies and identify them, plan, and prioritize these projects. And these projects can take on all levels of complexity with the more complex ones involving detailed design, bidding, and construction contracts. And then others can be readily performed in-house. We have 31 of these projects going on countywide at this point. I'd like to point out in a picture here, it isn't just about improving performance and capacity of the system, but also if this infrastructure fails uh, below the surface, such as a roadway, uh, the picture on the left there shows you the catastrophic results of not keeping up with that infrastructure. A few of the pictures to the right show an example of a cured-in-place pipeline lining project going on. As you could imagine, this represents a very cost-effective way to address deteriorating pipe without digging up a roadway, disrupting traffic, visitors, and businesses. So all of these are brought to bear as part of our countywide efforts. 
I want to take a minute and talk about some examples here in, in my city of Tarpon Springs. These are just examples of uh, the many projects going on countywide that you're hearing about here. Uh, I'd like to start with one of our main lift stations. It's called the River Village Lift Station, and it's in a low-lying area next to the Enclote River. We identified a deteriorated pipeline that leads into the lift station that was causing infiltration of groundwater. And that's water that really doesn't belong in the sewer system, and it really comes to play in, during storm events when you need every bit of capacity that you can get that serves to subtract from what we need to be doing. So when we can isolate these problems and, and correct them, it makes a big difference in our performance. Another example, uh, some pictures here, it looks like they're not in this slide, but there's some manhole replacements we've done. And um, manhole replacements, similarly, if the walls are cracked and the groundwater is able to leak in, that's just additional water that really shouldn't have to be treated. And there's also some parallel effects from that. You can get odor complaints because the manholes are leaking into the atmosphere and affecting surrounding customers. So uh, a few more examples we have are um, manhole inserts. You also hear them as rain trays. We found some success installing those in, more, in some of our low-lying areas, and we actually measured the response after the big storms and found a significant improvement to the point that we're going to continue on with about 200 more of those in our ongoing efforts. Other miscellaneous things we've come across are these service laterals you hear about, where you might get an offset joint, and that's when you're looking down the pipe. You actually have joints that don't line up, and you can imagine the effects of the water doesn't quite flow through them like they should, and it also allows groundwater to come in into the system. So um, in all, we have about eight different lining programs happening with a total of over 2,000 linear feet in Tarpon Springs, and we also have 10 manhole replacement or repair projects that are planned. So all this, I'd like to add, has been identified through our inspection program. With that, I'd like to ask Tom Nichols to come up, City of Gulfport. Thank you. I'd like to take a few minutes this morning and talk about how stormwater projects directly benefit our wastewater system. The white, let me see. The white clouds on the screen represent current stormwater projects throughout Pinellas County. But more importantly, we have identified wastewater assets that are affected by stormwater inflow as shown by the red clouds. Stormwater improvement projects are a key strategy to assist in reducing inflow and infiltration into our sewer system. Here is an example of how wastewater assets can be impacted by stormwater inflow. The green shaded area shows flood prone areas that are directly over wastewater assets. The circled areas show manholes with confirmed sanitary sewer overflows. This is an area where we will look at stormwater conveyance improvements as well as pipe relining and manhole repair to help prevent stormwater from getting into the sewer system. Here is a project currently being evaluated in the McKay Creek watershed where the sanitary sewer system is within the pond limits. Critical water elevations that can cause water to inflow into the sewer system have been identified through hydraulic modeling. Proposed improvements for this area include upsizing the pond to mitigate flooding, and inflow and infiltration, installing manhole rain covers, and to improve the stormwater system to properly convey stormwater downstream. We are also working together to use countywide cooperative purchasing contracts, which for smaller cities such as Gulfport save time, resources, and we gain economies of scale, which we would not receive if we competed uh, on our own. The county also received money from a BP Restore Fund, which was shared with the municipalities within a task force for stormwater improvements and flow monitoring projects. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Claude. Thank you. So I want to talk about our public dialogue, uh, how we are engaging with the public and how we are working with the private entities that discharge into our systems. So on the, on the public dialogue, here we are today. That's exactly what we're doing. We've been doing this now every six months, bringing to you the update of what this working group has been working on. Uh, we, we meet about once a month, sometimes twice a month, depending on what we're working on. 
but uh, we're, we're coming together for events to reach out to the citizens, to our families, uh, sometimes in fun events, sometimes in these kind of meetings, um, but we're working together to incorporate the best practices because being, you know, the most densely populated county in the state of Florida, even though I'm St. Pete and somebody else may be Largo, we're all in this together. And uh, our, our stormwater issues are similar and our wastewater issues are similar. And so bringing the public together to look at this as a holistic program is, is very important to us. We do have the Tampa Bay Estuary Program working with us uh, to, to put together a five-year campaign to help us prevent the, these overflows because obviously that helps with their campaign to keep the, the bay clean. Uh, and they, they're working with us to come up with some, some pilot programs for what we've been talking about in terms of the private sewer laterals. So at the very beginning, Megan did a really good job of explaining how our systems are integrated between the public and the private. And there are many ways that we could have private systems. We have some neighborhoods that are 100% private. The collection systems within that neighborhood, the list station within that neighborhood is private. But then even down to the level of each and every one of us, our parcels that we live on or that our business is on, when, this, when the plumbing system ends at our wall, that's where the private system begins to take the wastewater out to the public system. And these private systems can and do contribute to the I and I problem. Uh, nationally, there have been studies done to indicate that the, the uh, contribution of the private systems is anywhere between 30 and 70 percent. 30 and 70 percent, what a huge range. What, where, where are we? Well, right now I can tell you that the city of Gulfport, the city of St. Petersburg, uh, the, uh, the county and, and many of the other municipalities are going through programs to try to determine what is that percentage here. And we know that that percentage will be on, you know, broken down on a, on a case by case basis by neighborhood, by the age of the neighborhood, the, um, the elevation of the neighborhood. There, there's a lot of different factors that'll be involved, but we, we are working to try to figure out what it is here that is the private um, inflow and infiltration uh, co contribution. One of the things we're working on though is to put together an ordinance that could be used countywide that we anticipate and hope will be adopted by the county as well as all the other municipalities and utilities within the county that will make it as, as standard as possible across the county in all the jurisdictions on how to deal with the private laterals. Uh, the state and many of us currently have laws on the books that state that it is illegal to introduce stormwater and groundwater into wastewater collection systems. So that's already established. That's established law. What we don't have right now, and what surprisingly enough we're finding is does not exist in other municipalities in the state of Florida, is how to encourage and cooperate and enforce that law. And so that's what we're doing. We're working together to put together this ordinance that would establish the responsibility of the public sector to maintain their facilities and to accept and treat and safely dispose of the sewage provided to the public facility by the private user, users. The, the ordinance will establish that. It will also establish the responsibility, the responsibility of the private users to make sure that their systems are not introducing stormwater and groundwater into the public system. And for us as the private users, we may not know this happening. As long as our sewage is not backing up into our house, we don't have any indication, we don't have any way of knowing that we may be introducing stormwater or groundwater into the system. So our ordinance is going to be looking at a way that we can work with the private citizens, with the private utilities, to make sure that we can find ways to check, find ways to establish whether there is this leakage or not. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it back for the closing remarks, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning.
Thank you, Clyde. And uh, while we're on the subject of private uh, lateral lines and home, uh, private sewer lines and homes, uh, the city of Gulfport just came out with a great program um, to match funds for homeowners who want to replace their lateral lines. It's, um, if you'd like to learn more, go to the City of Gulfport website. I'm sure we can also post that information on the task force website as well in the, in the coming days. So I just wanted to announce that. Uh, moving on to conclude, I, as you can see, the task force has started implementing and made significant progress on five of the seven initiatives identified in the action plan. Great strides are being made with inflow and infiltration studies, identification of and correction to hydraulic bottlenecks, implementing replacement and rehabilitation programs, and identifying stormwater drainage improvements that will minimize impact to the sewer systems. We have demonstrated that the Wastewater Stormwater Partnership is successfully working together towards common goals of avoiding and mitigating sewer spills, seeking opportunities to address stormwater drainage that impact the sewer system, and increasing capacity and resiliency of our collective wastewater infrastructure. The remaining two initiatives are public dialogue and legislation to address the private sewer lines and systems. Even if we, the public utilities, complete every project to address the first five initiatives, our community's success depends on the awareness and involvement of our citizens. As you have seen, efforts are currently underway to address these two items through development of a social marketing campaign, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and research of legislative options. It is our intent to present options for these last two initiatives to the steering committee to consider in the coming months. In conclusion, on behalf of my partners from the technical working group, I would like to thank the steering committee for your continued leadership and support through your guidance, we have been able to collaborate and ultimately take action to invest, improve, and maintain our critical wastewater and stormwater infrastructure that is so vital for our community. At this time, I'd like to invite Pinellas County Commissioner Charlie Justice back to the stage to um, moderate a question and answer portion of our program here today. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Thank you to the entire committee. Let's give them a hand for their work. And you can see the work is impressive, and it's on a parallel path. They're not only tackling these new issues that we presented with them in October of 2016, but they're also doing their day jobs, which is our normal maintenance and operations of our system. So we appreciate all the effort that you're putting into it. Before we get into the question and answer, I do want to recognize my colleague and good friend, Commissioner Dave Eggers has arrived. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. We appreciate it. And you also heard about the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. I want to recognize Executive Director Ed Sherwood is in the audience. Thank you, Ed, for being here this morning as well. So let's begin with some questions. If you have a question for the committee, uh, do we have a microphone? Jim, if you stand up, there's a microphone right behind you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, my question, uh, I believe that most of our problem is 95% wastewater. So my question is about the single family homes that have their downspouts hooked to their sewer line. We know what's happening. Do we have the power to make the homeowner disconnect them? I understand that there, there is a law on the books, but it's, it's still going on. Maybe we should have, every city should have in their uh, building codes that you will not put your stormwater lines, hook it to your sewer lines. So I, I'm sure it's happening. I just want to throw that out there. So, so yes, sir. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. It, it is happening. And uh, what, what you'll often see is during these smoke testing uh, work that's being done during this dry time of year, when you see the smoke billowing out of somebody's gutter, therefore you know that it is connected. Uh, the, at the city of St. Petersburg, we actually have one of our code enforcement officials with us while we're doing this test so that they can, it, they, they can write down and monitor the address, what was seen, we can take photographs, and then we will contact the homeowner and, and let them know how this does impact our system and ask them to please disconnect it and we give them a time frame to disconnect it and uh, we have found actually that that the vast majority of the homeowners were unaware that they had done it or um, and, and if even if they were aware they were very willing to work with us we've heard uh, I was at a forum I don't know a few months back and and one of our state legislators uh, opined that 
people were just during the stormy season just opening up their cleanouts and letting the water flow in. Do we have an idea of, I mean, realistically, how, how often that's happening? Frequently. <laughs> Frequently. Yeah. I mean, I never thought to do it at my own home, so, uh, but uh, now I have an idea, I guess. Yeah, very, very, <laughs> kidding. very, very frequently. Um, of course, all of us, we, we tend, you know, there's, there's the, the saying that uh, uh, think globally, act locally. So when our own yards are flooding, we want to act locally to that. And oftentimes our folks just don't realize what happens when they're draining their own yard. Yay, good for them, but they don't realize the impact to their public utility. And so that's part of our public dialogue. A number of us, I'm sure all of us, are also looking at and already installing uh, caps on the city side that actually prevent the homeowner from unscrewing them. So we have locked caps that we can control. Now, that's not true with the homeowner himself, but we're usually down gradient from them, so they usually like to open ours. So we make sure they can't open ours. And uh, dealing uh, our public uh, relations work, we hope, will help us get the message out to folks out there in the community that opening up your drain spout or um, your uh, sewer cap or having your roof leaders attached to uh, the sewer system is a bad idea and that we all need to work together. Because in reality, this is a team effort. Our customers, our utilities, our cities, we all are one. We work together collaboratively and we all need to understand what we need to do to make this successful together. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Another question? Commissioner Eggers? We have a microphone. Yep. Thank you. Uh, also, thank you to the professionals that do this every day. I know you guys have been working on it. Guys and gals have been working on it for years before this came to light in the last couple of years. So thank you for all the work that you've done and continue to do. Uh, for those of us uh, that might be in decision making or our residents who might be listening, uh, what's uh, just uh, the estimate? Uh, can we come up with an estimate of how we're making progress in a percentage on our stormwater side and and on our sewer side of making this problem uh, better. In other words, have we, have, we, have we taken care of 5% of the problem or are we at 25% solution? How much further do we have to go? I think that's important for us to continue investing dollars in probably one of the most important things that we can be doing. But we got to hear from you guys, candidly, what that, ch what that challenge is. So thank you. Well, as far as the action items, there were seven action items identified. And as, as we stated in the presentation, five of those are significantly underway um, as far as those infrastructure components. But a lot of those projects um, identified for this year, you know, we need to identify projects for next year, the year after, the year after. So, you know, that piece is underway and is taking place, but it is going to take time to actually go and make those investments and do that work. The last two pieces are what we're going to be focusing on are the legislation and the public dialogue, which are the two pieces that we really need to get a strategic approach to and wrap our hands around. Anyone else? Yes, yeah. uh, one of the ways that we can measure our success is to have data that shows us what the flow rates and the flow volumes are in our systems during dry periods as well as during rainy periods. And one of the things that uh, the county has done is very graciously, very generously, has shared some of the county BP money with the municipalities to help all of us put flow monitors into our collection system so that we can start collecting this data. Uh, as, as with any time that you're collecting data, it takes a little while to get the data and go through it and analyze it. I, I can tell you, though, that the preliminary information that the City of St. Petersburg has from our data is that some of the efforts we have put in to reduce inflow into our system seems to have paid off to, a, to an approximate 10 percent reduction in the inflow values. And that was a, a, a big surprise and a, a very happy surprise for us. We still have a ways to go. Um, but one of the things we have to keep in mind is that these systems are already old. They will continue to be old. And even though we're putting money into them now to fix them, as we're doing that, other portions of the system continue to age and deteriorate. So I think part of the paradigm shift we must have as a society is that this problem isn't a one and done, we fixed it, and now we can ignore it again. 
Um, it, we're we're going to have to make the recognition that we must be committed to constantly, year after year after year, constantly invest the right amount of money to keep these systems operating at their capacity. I'd like to add that um, depending upon, you know, as, as we talked about throughout the, the presentation today, we are working in different parts of our system as we find issues. So at this point, we're still finding issues and repairing them as we go. So we can talk about you know, what, what is the success in this particular area or that particular area um, easier than we can talk about the whole system because, as Claude just mentioned, it's an ongoing situation that we're working on continuously. But we've seen some major strides in Clearwater. We've seen at least 10 to 15 percent in one of our basins since we uh, did many of the things we're talking about here. But I want to caution everyone that that number was be ba is based on the storms that we saw since Hermine. Now, the intensity of the storm has a lot to do with the percentage of, of success that you've actually seen. Now, we're hoping it's going to be consistent, even with a bigger storm. But the last storm we had wasn't as, as rainy or as much water involved as Hermine was. But we are definitely seeing progress, and that's what's important. So we're making strides and moving ahead and moving ahead. And I feel very confident that over time we're really going to see a major difference. But as Claude said, our systems are all fairly uh, old at this point, and they're going to, it's going to be a continuous re rehabilitation and replacement project forevermore. That's just the way the system works. If I may add to that, Paul Smith here. Uh, one of the things we haven't really talked about is some of our other partners that we're really going to be needing to work with, including our power company. I think as we move forward and we're um, taking care of the things we directly control, getting that low-hanging fruit, I think we're going to really be looking towards our utility partners, the things that we don't totally control, because although we've made big investments in more portable generators, we all know the logistics of that, getting those people around to drag those things around from place to place for 24 hours, for sure, five to seven <laughs> days. Um, if we can cut back on that through more reliability with the electrical grid, I think that the chances of these overflows goes down as well. So I see that as a strategic partner moving forward as well. Absolutely, I concur. And I think from a, a lot from the certainly the policymaker and the public perception from where we were in the fall of 2016 to where uh, the world was coming to an end, uh, to get to a point where we've identified the problem and actually have a laundry list of you know uh, of goals and what's the next box to check off is um, significant progress as far as I'm concerned. So further questions. Mayor Kreisman. Thank you. <clears throat> Since I saw legislation uh, up on the, the board a few minutes ago, uh, I'm wondering what kind of conversations we've had or do we need to have, uh, starting with our, our state delegation, uh, to talk about a program um, that we could implement that's kind of similar to, if you all remember, my safe Florida home, uh, where uh, free inspection was done for um, wind to determine how susceptible your home was to hurricanes, a detailed report was done, and then um, there was matching funds up to 5,000 made available by the state. Uh, I think we all know that laterals, private laterals, are a significant source of uh, the INI, and maybe some kind of program similar uh, with state funding to not only pay for the inspections, but matching funds. Uh, has those conversations taken place, do we know of? If not, certainly I think uh, if a program is put forward, then it's incumbent on all of us as elected officials uh, to lobby our legislators. And if not, we might even want to consider looking at Penny uh, countywide off the top uh, to fund such a, a similar type program since it impacts all of us countywide. Who would like to tackle that one? Well, I mean, I can say there's definitely been a lot of discussions on this particular issue, and um, I, I don't know that we're ready at this point to bring that forward. I think there's going to need to be more discussions and agreement on that total picture of what we're looking at. So, um, you know, our first initiatives are really to tackle our infrastructure piece and get that going. And um, I believe now we're going to turn focus towards what you just stated is looking at all those other opportunities for private lines. Does anyone else have anything to share on that? Yeah, I did want to say that one of our initiatives that 
I think we're very, very close on is to come up with an ordinance that will address private laterals and the responsibility of homeowners as well as the cities and, and county. Um, we felt pretty strongly that that needed to be uh, accomplished first because then we will have the tool necessary to move forward if the legislation were to take place. I think once that tool is in place, then we are going to be working toward coming up with a recommendation. It certainly wouldn't be this task force that will bring it to the legislature. We will be, we'll be coming to you folks, our decision makers, and asking you to work with us and, and um, talk and see if we can find a legislator that wants to sponsor such a bill. So that is where we are. We are moving forward uh, with it, however. Next question. Joe Farrell, Pinellas Realtor Organization. Uh, thank you, Mayor Christman. You stole most of my question. Uh, very good question, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, to follow up on the private lateral issue and legislation, if you will, when will you be rolling out some of these ideas, whether it's mandatory, voluntary, uh, cost, I mean, funding, public, private, and all those kind of things? Uh, when will the public be able to see some of those things as they affect property owners? Very important. We don't have a, a, an exact date at this point in time. You know, we have 17 different municipalities, so we, we want to agree on something, first of all. But we've been having the discussion, so it's been an ongoing discussion. We have a lot of different ideas. We are also looking towards nationwide. What are other municipalities? We are, we're not alone. You know, there's other municipalities that are doing things with regards to private laterals, whether it's going in and replacing them themselves or putting an ordinance in place. So we're, we're actually looking outside the state of Florida to what other municipalities are doing throughout the nation um, because we're, pretty, it's, we're on the cutting edge as far as Florida, the state of Florida. So we're just looking at best practices. Uh, putting a framework, what does it mean, what is the definition of a deteriorated private lateral line, how do we define that, and we're working with our legal counsels as well, so we don't have a firm, I, I'd hate to give you a date and then not be able to meet it, but hopefully within the next, you know, coming months we can, we can firm up that date and, and post that on our website. Do we have a, uh, a, an identification of one type of lateral or another that's deteriorated faster to where if we know a particular subdivision was created with one type of lateral, that's going to be the first to go? Uh, it, it would be the Orangeburg type of pipe. Orangeburg is an uh, asphalted type paper that was rolled up and they used those in the uh, early 50s and 40s when they were building a lot of the original St. Petersburg or uh, areas in the county. So if there's a neighborhood that has Orangeburg, that's probably one of the worst areas. I guess the question really is, is how do you go after those? Those are some of your older homes and maybe a lot of people are on fixed incomes. How do you go ahead and say, you have a problem, you have to fix that? And if they can't, again, going back to Mr. Kreisman, how do you go ahead and help them do that? Uh, with, that's part of what that INI study is doing. They're trying to locate those areas, those older neighborhoods. And once we find those, then we need to go out and reach them. But you actually say, well, you have a problem, you have to fix it. And if they don't fix it, do you actually plug their lines? That certainly isn't something we're looking to do. So we have to work together, again, letting our residents, our customers know that there is an issue. And together, how do we get past that? So that's a good point. Another solution in our Another solution in our toolbox we're looking at is a warranty program. I believe Pinellas County's done a cooperative bid to explore uh, what's going on out there with that possibility. If that comes to be, there may be a cost-effective way for homeowners to purchase a, uh, a monthly at a reasonable rate, some sort of coverage that would allow them to make these repairs without a large out-of-pocket expense. So there's a lot of different tools we're looking at here for a solution, and um, so that's just one more. And now, to complicate issues even more, the, the reality is it's not just the type of materials, because it's also where they're, where they're installed. So if you're in an area that's high and dry, even if the piping itself is not in really great shape, it may not contribute a tremendous amount to inflow, um, as opposed to some piping that may be even newer that just may not be put together properly, have some open joints, but sit in an area that's very near the ocean <laughs> and has a lot of high groundwater table. Or, or has uh, uh, the effect of tides. So 
it's a very complex issue. I know it sounds easy, but it's very complex. And that also makes the, the, the um, um, development of an ordinance very difficult because you have to address all these issues. So that's why it's taking some time. I, I can confirm, though, that those of us that are working on the ordinance, our, our, our strong desire is to find a way to empower and encourage all of us uh, to use as big of a carrot as we can get and save the stick for the end, because it really shouldn't be a stick. Right. We're, we're all in this together. Uh, the, the public system belongs to us. It belongs to you and you and you and you and you. It belongs to you. But then on top of that, you have your own specific part of the system that is yours to maintain. And the expectation is, is that all of us accept that responsibility and not, it's not forced upon us as a mandatory thing, but that we all accept it. Already, as I mentioned earlier, both state law and local laws state that it is illegal to introduce groundwater and stormwater into wastewater collection systems. So you could say that that's the mandatory part. We've already got it mandatory. It's illegal. You can't do it. So now we just need to find a way for all of us to work together so that we don't bankrupt anybody. We don't put an unfair burden on anybody. And we all pitch in and help each other to get this problem solved. OK, question in the back. Yes, sir. I'd, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for the hard work that you're doing and the progress that you're making. But we all know that no matter what kind of a system is there, whether, whether it's a, a sewage system or an electrical system, it has capacities. There's a lot of research done, a lot of contracts given. Has anybody done a contract that once all of the fixes that you have identified are completed, what is the carrying capacity for Pinellas County? Because no matter what we do with the system, if we overpopulate the county, we're going to run into the same problem again because the system won't handle the growth that's there. So we should have a study that says this is what the carrying capacity is, and that should then lead the leaders at, at the county and at municipalities to determine what kind of growth we can sustain and still maintain a quality of life that the people in Pinellas County want. So is there some idea of what the carrying capacity is once you finish all these improvements? If I may, yes. The City of St. Petersburg has done that analysis on our system. Our, um, our capacity, the carrying capacity of the collection system far, out, far exceeds our ability to actually treat and dispose. So we've got plenty of carrying capacity, so to speak. The problem that we run into is not the is not the capacity to deal with the people who are here. It's the capacity to deal with the leaks in the system. And those leaks are going to be here. Those leaks are here regardless of how many of us are here. The leaks are what's causing the problem. And to give you the perfect example, the studies that we have done, just as you've suggested, suggest that on an average basis, the city of St. Petersburg, the humans, in the city of St. Petersburg produce about 20 million gallons of sewage per day. That's 20 million gallons of sewage per day. Our treatment plants are permitted and designed and permitted to treat 56. What we've seen is that during a storm like Hermine, we're getting 150. We're not getting 150 because we've quintupled the number of people in the city during the storm. We're getting it because of the leaks in the system. So if, if, if we had a completely watertight, completely watertight system, which quite frankly I think is technically impossible, but if we did, then within the city of St. Petersburg, we could theoretically double our population and still have the treatment capacity to deal with the sewage. So it is, it is not a people issue. It is a system that's broken and is leaking and letting in billions of gallons of stormwater and groundwater, and that's the problem. And I'll echo what Claude said. It's, I think we're all in the exact same 
our, our design capacities well exceed our typical daily flow on a non-rainy day um, by factors of two, three, four times. So in some cases, it's really that rain event and the stormwater, groundwater intrusion that is, that is causing the issue. And I, and I would say that also holds true for our effluent disposal capacity from our plans. We all have sufficient capacity in effluent disposal to handle the treatment facilities that we have as well. So as, as my colleague said, it's really not as much a people issue as it is an extraneous water issue, and we're working on that. It's a question up front. My name is Walter Donnelly. I'm from the Alliance for Bayway Communities. I, I live 100 yards from uh, the Southwest Treatment Plant in St. Pete. So correcting this problem is very critical to me and my neighbors. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is the end game. Uh, uh, there is a funnel for all these systems, and it starts in private property, and uh, that's very leaky. Uh, everybody here has discussed that and knows it. And, and what happens in a storm event, a wet weather storm event, is uh, all, all the plants in the county uh, treat as fast as they can. But if the storm is severe enough, uh, they get overwhelmed. And uh, as I understand it, the law says that uh, each plant has to have one day of, of storage for stuff that they just can't treat. And that's perhaps the five million gallon a day, uh, million gallon plant from Largo. And I have uh, right next to me at the Southwest plant, a 15 million gallon tank. So what happens when that gets overwhelmed as has happened? And uh, that's what I would like to discuss here today. And the city of St. Petersburg has put four additional injection wells and for a total of seven right next to me to make sure that my, my property doesn't get flooded. And, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes it, the water is coming in fast enough that it doesn't quite meet the spec that the state uh, uh, mandates. Uh, but it's very close, it's 99% there. But this is a hurricane or a tropical storm or a wet weather event. And, uh, you know, we've seen in the paper now, uh, everybody, you know, gets all excited when it doesn't exactly meet that, that uh, spec. And what do you do with it? Um, I'm sure if we tried to send it to Tampa Bay Watch, say, would you take this excess water? They wouldn't want it. So it goes down the injection well. So what I'm asking for is if the county could have a rational discussion with the DEP about in extreme wet weather events, what is permissible other than the kind of black and white, you fall off a cliff spec that's in the, the state uh, rules? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. I, I, I will take a stab at, <laughs> at addressing that. So every time we have a, a hurricane or a disaster, we, we do have the opportunity on a state level for the state to declare an emergency. And also we have sometimes on a federal level for the feds to declare an emergency. And during those events, um, our, our state or federal government has the authority to waive any rules or regulations during that emergency that, um, that they feel are too onerous to continue to expect to be met during that emergency. But it's, it's not something that, that waiver is not something that the DEP as a department and as civil servants, they, they don't have the authority to make that determination. It must come directly from the governor or the president. And if we do not get that waiver, then we then we'll have what we saw during Irma, where pretty much every municipality, every utility throughout the state of Florida were assessed fines for the issues that they that resulted during that hurricane and and as my colleagues here mentioned for for some of us the issues that we had and where we were not able to meet our our um, our requirements had to do with the fact that we lost power it was completely out of our hands so um so it is a dialogue that we would love to have but we we i, I hate to do this but i'm going to put it back to our elected officials to continue to have that dialogue with the statewide elected officials to see if we can look at that in the future. Well, and, and to add one more comment, I, I've been doing this for a long time, over 45 years. So I've seen it 
change or the attitude change over time. Um, there is no sewer system in this world that we all operate today that was designed to meet every eventuality. They just don't exist. Um, if you were to design a sewer system that was big enough to handle any kind of flow rate that you might expect during a class three or four hurricane, it wouldn't work the rest of the time. The flows would be so low that there would be deposition in the sewers and there would be big problems. So that's not the way sewers were designed. I'm an engineer. I went to engineering school. I've designed sewer systems. The reality is that we don't do that. We design them for the average daily flow times a multiplier for peak flows that are traditionally seen in sewer systems. And then they tend to work, and of course this is empirical. You have figured it out over the last 150 years. This is the way they should work. So that is the way all the systems have been designed up until today. We are entering a new territory. Um, I think the expectation today is changing that SSOs should never happen. You should never see a sanitary sewer overflow. I myself personally believe that is not realistic. And thank goodness I have only got a few more years left to run a utility. But the, react but the reality is that is not realistic. And the reason for that is lots of things can cause an SSO. It is not just the storms. It is it's lots of things. Uh, you can have a contractor working uh, in your community and drill a hole through your pipe and bust it. And then you have got a sewer overflow. It is an SSO. You can have Greece, uh, there is a brand new term called the fatberg. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of it, but it is an amazing thing. If you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and search fatberg in London, and you will get a feel for what they are. But they are amazing. It's, today it is a, it's a reality. It's, it's a plug made of grease and, and sewer materials and what are traditionally now known as flushable wipes, which aren't. They are never meant to be flushable. But if you put all these things together, it forms a plug in the sewer, and it can happen anywhere in your sewer system instantaneously without you knowing, because all of a sudden it just plugs that last little bit, and you have got an SSO. So to expect the sewer system to never have an SSO is totally unrealistic. It will never happen, no matter what we do. But we are trying to get there. <laughs> we are doing our best. But those things that do cause SSOs that are within our ability to control, like the amount of infiltration and inflow and the age of the sewer system and rehabilitation and things of that nature, we are working very hard to fix those and get those taken care of. But I just want to make sure everybody understands that there is never going to be a time when there is never going to be an SSO. So it depends on the expectations of the regulatory folks. And where do their expectations come from? It comes from the folks. When the folks out here, our citizens, demand no SSOs. They hear that. That's where we end up. So we're doing a lot here. And then one of our major components is the public relations and public education component. We're going to be working on that quite a bit for the next five years. We're hoping to help folks understand just how our sewer system works and what the expectations are and the, rea and the reality of operation. So that's what we're doing. Further questions? Hi, I'm Lara Milligan. I'm with Pinellas County Extension as the Natural Resources Agent. Um, so my question, slightly biased, is have you considered working with and partnering with Extension to help fulfill the needs in the public uh, dialogue component? It's public education is what we do. Um, but I was also curious if you could talk a little bit more on the efforts with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program campaign and just a little bit more about what is planned with that. Well, I think we're always willing to work with any partners that want to assist us, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up. We'll, you know, get your information and, you know, have one of your colleagues start attending our meetings. Um, we, and we do work with the extension on other programs that are similar, Reclaim Water and Irrigation and Florida Friendly, so it makes sense that we would partner with you on something like this. The Tampa Bay Estuary Program campaign is really looking at how do we develop a framework for the public dialogue? A lot of the public, like we stated in our presentation, doesn't realize that they have ownership of a certain part of the sewer system. They also don't realize there could be a problem and or who to contact if they want it inspected 
what are those steps that we tell the public to take that are easy and simple and streamlined? So that's what the Tampa Bay Estuary Program is going to help us do. Um, you know, there's talk of doing some focus groups and working with us on what we need to accomplish with the ordinance and how we're going to give those very easy steps for our customers to follow to get their side of the sewer system taken care of. We have Ed Sherwood. Hi, Ed Sherwood with Tampa Estuary Program. So, Laura, yes, we would love to work with Extension. I think, uh, as was explained, the first component of that is developing the message that might resonate with homeowners. Um, much as we've done with the B Floridian campaign, we want to work with the Extension to spread, uh, spread that word, not only within Pinellas County, but also throughout the Tampa Bay watershed on the Hillsborough County, Manatee County side of the bay. So this is a systemic problem throughout the watershed, and, and it's something that we want to extend partnerships with anybody who's willing to work with us. Um, another point I wanted to make to the, to the group, um, there is uh, just recently announced some $5.5 billion through EPA, through WIFA funding, uh, Watershed Infrastructure Finance and uh, through Innovation Act funding. So that might be an opportunity to um, create some added supplements or credits or rebate programs for this um, private um, side of the issue. So that's something to look into in the future as well. I also had a question while I have the mic. Um, there was discussion, I think, early on um, back in 2015 to 2016 uh, for those facilities that did have capacity to accept additional sewage, is there, has there any been more dialogue between the wastewater treatment plant facilities, there's 12 of them now in the, in the county, of moving water around during those high flow events where people might have capacity except um, from a plant that might be running into some issues? Um, have, have those dialogues happened amongst the different municipalities? Or is there a plan now in place um, for the next event? that might alleviate some of those problems in the future? Great question. So, well, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Believe it or not, while I, that, that idea is a wonderful idea, it's also one of the most expensive ideas. It's um, because of the location of our different treatment plants, uh, they, they are not necessarily very close to each other. The sewage would not be able to tr be transferred most most likely by gravity. It would have to be transferred by pumping, which then involves uh, energy. Um, and so that's been, what we've been trying to focus on lately is, is the low, lower hanging fruit, the things that we know we can do um, that, that cost less money. Uh, St. Pete has not had any conversation with any of our neighbors yet about us um, doing that kind of transfer share. However, I can tell you within the city, we are looking long term of we've got three plants of connecting our three plants so that we can we can do that. Uh, we already have one project that's been designed and we're just waiting to implement it once we get the plants to the, where they need to be individually. Uh, and then um, we, we hope to one day have all three of our plants interconnected. Uh, but again, the, the cost to do that is so significant that we've been focusing in other areas. Yeah, and I, I'd like to add something to that as well. One of the other issues you have to consider when you start talking about changing um, or, or moving sewage from one community, it usually means moving it from one discharge location to another as well. So when you start taking sewage from one spot, taking it to another, and that plant discharges into uh, let's say Tampa Bay, at the old Tampa Bay, um, that's going to put additional loads on old Tampa Bay. So you, you have to, you know, it's, it's a very complex, um, very, I'll echo, extremely complex, extremely expensive proposition. Um, and we're, Clearwater, we're doing what St. Pete's doing. We have three facilities. We already have some interchangeability between the three plants, but not all we would like. We're looking at that. Um, but even we have that issue because two of our plants discharge to one location and one to another. And when you cross, now you've got to talk about permitting issues with the DEP because you're going to influence different, different uh, water bodies. So it's very complex even within your own city, but it gets really complex when you start talking across lines. Not to say it'll never happen, but it's down the road quite a ways. 
Another thing I'd like to mention is a lot of that water is really storm water that is in the sewer system, and that's really not the best treatment ability for that storm water. That storm water needs to go to storm water treatment facilities, which can treat that water and is designed to treat that water. Putting it into the wastewater system disrupts the entire treatment process when you have enough water in there um, and you know the biological process can't work appropriately. So you really want to get those two waters separated and where they need to be, they can get treated properly, and that will have the most minimal impact on our environment. Mr. Smith, did you have something? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to go back a minute to the public dialogue. I just wanted to add that the, uh, the power of communications with our citizens cannot be underestimated. I think uh, the example Pinellas County Utilities with the water use, if you look back historically what uh, we've been able to do with that, um, dropping that per capita water use through um, partnership with our communities and uh, incentive programs, I think that's the kind of successes we're looking for here with this type of problem. Thank you. Further questions? All right. We're going to wrap it up. Last chance for questions. Did want to recognize Mayor Bradbury for being here. We appreciate you being here. We have uh, City Managers Riley and Horn from Gulfport and Clearwater. We appreciate you all being here as well. All right. We appreciate the uh, work. Are there closing comments from you, uh, anyone on the committee, from what you've heard today? Anything else you want to add to the conversation? Nope. Said everything you wanted to say. I think, we, I think that collectively we want to thank all of our elected officials because without the effort that those folks have put in and, and the support that you've given us, especially not only in authority to have this committee and work on it, but also to fund the projects that we're talking about, uh, none of this would have been possible. And that then, then extends to all of our citizens because it's all of you that ultimately help us by giving us the funds to get this work done for all of us. And it's a, it is a partnership. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Porter. We, uh, let me just thank you again for being here, the audience, being here in the committee for doing its work. And I think many uh, naysayers back in October of 2016 when we first met thought this was a political or a uh, reaction to the crisis at the time. But uh, I appreciate that you all have consistently worked throughout the time to show that we are committed to uh, solving as many of the problems as possible. And I appreciate your good work. Thank you very much for being here today. Have a great day.